All right, I'm Mike Zahorek uh, with Print, of course, based in Chicago. And this is... My name is David. Uh, if you're looking at the program, you'll notice I'm not Jonathan. Yeah. Um, we, di we didn't do a body swap. Um, I came in place of Jonathan, so I um, recently joined Print Group as the director of pre-sales, and I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. And you have a interesting background uh, before joining Print, right? You uh, uh, Just name a few of the places you've worked, because I think okay. this is good to so know. So maybe we have some uh, yes, yeah, and yeah. familiar friends or enemies uh, <laughs> of uh, ContentServe. So I worked with, at ContentServe. I've worked within River. Uh, I've also worked at Valtech. Um, so we might have some frenemies or, or friends, hopefully, <laughs> of all those solution yeah. vendors. Uh, and TransPerfect. And TransPerfect, I did translation also in the past. So um, if you guys use translation services with someone like a TransPerfect, you yeah. might have also interacted with the same people uh, I worked with in the past. So Good. And so I um, joined in print in October, and I came from Adobe. My background is not as varied as yours. I was at Adobe for 25 years, and I was almost the entire time involved with InDesign. Uh, but I was the partner manager for InDesign, and uh, I was also basically the lead person to launch InDesign Server. I have some good friends here I'm seeing that uh, have I've worked with uh, in my role at Adobe. But Adobe is um, uh, it's fascinating for me to look at the, the history of what's happened in the last 25 years. And, uh, we were both at Adobe Summit um, three weeks ago in Las Vegas. So at this point, Adobe's kind of got two different heads or business units. Uh, of course, they have the creative products, Creative Cloud, InDesign. Um, this is still the biggest revenue part of the business. But I think on the marketing side, uh, Adobe is probably the biggest combined marketing platform. Uh, of course, there are a lot of other products, but we want to talk about where print fits in the context of kind of these marketing platforms. Um, and think of this more as a reference. Uh, I'm not here to try to promote Adobe's products, but I think the concepts that we were hearing at uh, Adobe Summit uh, are relevant to print, and we will talk about that. So uh, the agenda, I'm going to talk a little bit about this experience cloud and the whole omni-channel landscape. Uh, we're going to go over a couple of use cases, and then uh, David is going to talk a little bit more depth on content design for omni-channel. So looking at the experience cloud today, this is like a classic wheel of solutions, which very few companies have all of, right? You do tend to pick and choose uh, the components that uh, you really need, but uh, it really touches on uh, almost all aspects of marketing, except PIM. Uh, there is no PIM offering from Adobe or MDM offering, but almost everything else is in the mix, and you all can decide whether it's good or bad, I don't work for Adobe anymore, so it's fine to, uh, to criticize the products. But the big messages that uh, we heard, of course, are personalization at scale. This is talked about all the time. And I think for the digital channels, of course, you would expect that. Um, they talk a lot about collaboration. And you know, Workfront is probably the, the main tool that's driving that. Uh, Reducing cost, doing more with less, right? Uh, we're now at a, at a different economic point where uh, it's not just about growth, it's about managing your costs. So these are uh, some of the, the big themes that we're, we're hearing. One of the um, probably most ubiquitous, overused buzzwords that you hear is omnichannel, which for us coming from a print background, is it's almost comical because you go talk to all the companies and you ask them about the print channel and they all freeze up. It's, it's not thought of, it, they don't think about this. Most of these systems don't think about print as a equal channel. 
It's your offline channel. And uh, I think that we, uh, we here collectively, I think at Print, with Print Cloud and, and Print Suite, we have the tools that enable your offline channel to become online. But of course, this is really up to you and your, uh, your goals and, and vision to do so. So it's fun coming here. We hear some amazing stories that we'll try to talk about a little bit. Um, so anyway, these are some of the themes. And then the other one that uh, we decided not to go into detail on, but uh, is inescapable now, is AI. Uh, and it's, everybody has to talk about the AI in their products. And it just, it kind of makes me crazy uh, to, it's both fascinating, but there is a lot of marketing hype going on there. And originally we thought about bringing that up, but we elected not to. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this, this concept. One of the other things that you hear uh, Adobe starting to talk about is the content supply chain. Um, this isn't a new concept. It's just Adobe talking about some technologies now that can be connected together and they're going to try to sell more as a solution. So you have Workfront as your collaboration platform. Workfront also includes uh, kind of an automation engine in Fusion. So you'll see Adobe doing more with uh, that tool to connect some of the different processes. Uh, you've got uh, AEM and, and AEM assets, so the, the, the DAM component to store this. But I think the new kid on the block, <coughs> long overdue, is these new Creative Cloud uh, services. So uh, we all are InDesign users, uh, our companies are. And InDesign is a little bit of an anomaly because InDesign Server has been around for years. And uh, Adobe has always resisted a Photoshop server or an Illustrator server. Uh, people have been asking, and I probably have heard this more than anyone when I was at Adobe, how come you won't sell me a Photoshop server or even an Acrobat server? Well, what Adobe has elected to do is to make cloud services. So they're coming along pretty nicely. Uh, Photoshop, I think, of all the Creative Cloud services is uh, the furthest along in terms of functionality. And uh, the other ones are all following. InDesign uh, will have cloud services this year. And we're at, we at Print are actively testing, seeing how we could bring our solutions onto that. Um, the other one, I'm not going to go into detail, but it's also, I think it's worth looking at the document cloud services. Adobe is opening up more there, and um, in particular, uh, I'm not sure if this is directly relevant to the publishing efforts, but Adobe's putting a lot into services around document intelligence, so uh, being able to analyze PDF documents. So anyway, there's, there's a lot going on. Adobe is now, I think, pretty serious about the cloud. So content supply chain is an attempt to bring all of these things together. Um, but again, print. They're not really thinking about print so much right now. And I expect that the leadership for content automation, content supply chain, is really going to continue to come from partners like print, and we're not the only ones on the, in the market doing this, but I think we have some of the most advanced solutions. So uh, again, another one of these, uh, these new marketing pitches that you'll hear about. Um, so one of the ways that you bring your, your print channel into omni-channel is to start to look at personalization in the customer information that is available on some of these other products. So the analytics product are starting to tell you, you know, what might work and might not. Now this is probably the single biggest challenge with the print channel uh, is attribution. And it's interesting talking to people that are doing 
uh, really amazing things with their print products, um, trying to understand what is the impact. So I think this is something we all have to continue to look for, are ways to measure the effectiveness of print. It's not as precise as digital, but I think all of us here believe that the print channel has its own purpose and power and how they play together nicely with some of the other digital channels. But again, applying some of these products to personalization, um, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, AEM assets and storing the components, linking to these components in AEM assets from uh, InDesign, as well as Illustrator too. Uh, pulling your pricing from uh, commerce or ERP systems. Um, and then uh, integrating print into uh, tools like Adobe Campaign and Adobe Journey Optimizer. Uh, campaign is all about orchestrating different marketing campaigns and think about your, how your print uh, touch points fit within all of that. And then Journey Optimizer is much more about kind of the individual and what you want to send to that individual. So, you know, historically you couldn't do one-to-one -one personalization with print, but that has changed now. And I think this is where the overall world of, of digital marketing, the awareness of this is lagging. Not so much with you all here, but uh, the ability to do personalized print through solutions like ours, uh, combined with this, it's, it's here right now. You know, we just look a little bit at um, a kind of a crude screenshot I grabbed from campaign uh, and, you know, different triggers when you should be sending an email out or direct mail, but there's a lot of different branches that you could start to think about where you're using your print touch points. So let's talk about a couple of different services that we have. Um, so we have built a data sheet service for Akenio, uh, but this is something you'll see us make available with most of the PIM systems. Uh, we're just getting started here. And uh, you know, data sheets was the obvious starting point, but I think this is the cloud service, the print cloud service is something that we easily can adapt to other use cases. Uh, probably one of the more useful and least exciting is labels. Uh, everyone has to do labels of some sort, and this should be completely automated. Uh, but for right now, we can look at the data sheet service. So um, in kind of a little bit more manual way, you've got a product manager notified about a new product. Uh, they're gonna select the appropriate template for this, and the data sheet is created automatically. It's a headless process. Um, and then the data sheet is pushed to assets or your website. Uh, so this is something that uh, we're starting to see our customers use, and uh, Matt was talking yesterday uh, at, uh, I'm gonna screw up the name of the company, Asa Abloy? Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, with the way they've used the data sheet service and they have plans to automatically generate new data sheets when there's any changes at all. So remove the product manager from that step in the workflow and just have triggers that are generating the new, uh, the new data sheets. Uh, so you can extend this to direct mail and uh, we know we have a few customers doing this already today. Um, I think Wago has, has been telling a, a terrific story about some of this. Uh, but again, you can, you can start to see how uh, when you're doing direct mail, you're pulling across some of the other components. Uh, you're starting with your own PIM, uh, but you're now taking the design tools to create the base template, uh, Print Suite and Print Cloud to bring this all together. So the workflow on this is uh, pretty straightforward. You look at where the customer has been visiting on your web shop. 
uh, maybe they have left some products in an abandoned shopping cart and they've gone without purchasing. So this is a marketing trigger. And again, this is where I think some of those other orchestration tools uh, can help to, to um, orchestrate the process. Uh, so from that trigger, you can um, create a direct mail piece. Um, you know, and I think one of the things I like to, maybe I'm getting a little particular on this, uh, we're not a full, the, the, the print suite or print cloud, it's not a full VDP solution. We're not trying to pretend it is that on its own. You're still probably gonna work with a direct mail uh, provider, but I think the concept of personalized content is what we enable that most VDP engines can't do. So the, the ability to reach into your PIM system, your DAM system, your CMS system, take all that content and build a piece that's very personalized for one customer only is possible, and it's being done today. Um, I, I don't know if you have any other examples, Torsten, of uh, customers that are doing clever things in this area. I'm new enough to mm. print where I don't, uh, I don't know all the customer yeah. use cases. I'm hearing a lot here. Uh, I also don't know all customer use cases. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Euronics is doing something like that where we have like set up um, a print suite in that case yep. with, a, with an InDesign server and it, um, it's completely automatic. Um, it's triggered by the web and um, um, a postcard um, with, a, with an individual um, imprint is uh, yep. generated automatically and sent back to the calling system. Yep. Yep. Stuff like that. Right. I think Vago are, if I'm not mistaken, are doing like personalized data sheets where mm -hmm. you can say, so yep. I want data sheets, and, uh, but I just need to uh, focus on this or that information inside the data sheet. Yep. I, I think they're also doing like um, faceted data sheets where you say, okay, I need products with um, some technical attributes like this and that with yep. uh, certain um, <clears throat> properties and say, okay, print me a data sheet of all um, products that fit those um, those properties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's some fascinating things going on. I was talking to a gentleman last night who uh, sold, I think, his company to Laudert and he was describing just highly personalized print one-on-one -on -one type print uh, content creation. And again, I, and part of me, I think it's you, some of you are aware of this. I, I, we need to try to tell the story to the market as well and get uh, your colleagues that are in the digital marketing department or maybe the e-commerce department to, uh, to, pay, to understand this. You, you tend to have people that scoff at print because they don't understand the power of it. Um, so let's, yeah, so anyway, that's the direct mail chain here, and we know that it has a high impact if a customer receives a piece that's timely, targeted, has the right product information, <laughs> they're going to come back to your website. So from now, there, David, I will turn things over to you to talk sure. about content design. Cool, thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the purpose of my presentation, so I know we have a lot of different people in the audience today which are potentially customers who are enriching content themselves. Maybe you're with an SI who helps people architect and implement different software solutions, or maybe you're just a print dork like I was before I joined here. Um, but what I would like to talk about kind of is like projects, right? How do projects come together? Where does print fit within a project? And what are the unique data points that print might have that could be potentially re-leveraged or reused repackaged for other channels. Because so I feel this often gets left out of the equation. A lot of companies have super awesome, very visually compelling content that is in print that they don't have anywhere else, right? Um, so that's a missed opportunity, not only in the print channel, but also for other channels that you have that could potentially use those data points. So um, what I would like to do is kind of start off, I've again done PIM implementations for many years, uh, both as an SI and also helping in professional services for PIM vendors. But um, I want to start off with uh, kind of like a kickoff from a, a PIM implementation, right? <laughs> so what happens? What's the first thing that happens? We get to meet the VP of marketing. Uh, this guy controls the budget, right? This guy controls all the decisions. Uh, this guy gets to choose what pieces are architected. He's kind of like a superhero rock star uh, within the company, right? Um, everyone cares about him getting the products on your website looking awesome, right? 
Um, everyone wants to give him attention. He gets headcount. He gets budget. He gets to make a lot of big decisions. Um, and he's pretty much the focus, right? That channel becomes the focus for the project. Um, then, at some point, 18 months later, let's say, we finally get to meet the <coughs> print team or the creative team. Uh, and a lot of times when we meet them, it's kind of more like, you know, a group of people who we didn't even know worked here. Um, or <laughs> people with these archaic uh, templates and layouts and you know, might as well be speaking a language we don't understand, right? They're, they kind of feel like conspiracy nuts in a way, right? Um, and people don't really understand what they do or what they're doing, right? What are their data needs? You know, what tools are they actually even leveraging? It's like a complete like, Bleh, right? Um, so, and these people are obviously not in control of the budget. <laughs> You know, this is like phase two or three or four. Um, but at the same time, they are the actual gatekeepers of a lot of super good content in many cases. Um, so if we want to look at, uh, this is probably a bit hard to see. I apologize. Um, never know what the room is going to be like until you get here. Um, but if we look at the different actual customer touch points, right? So people that see your content, um, it could be on the left-hand side. What, the, what this is intended to represent is a brand site or mobile experience that you as a brand are in charge of. So you have a website, maybe. Um, your customers might be accessing that information on a, on a mobile device, in which case you might have responsive design. So the objects and elements will shift around to match the device that they're using. You might even have a mobile app, depending on your level of maturity and need for that. In the center, you might also be sending your information to marketplaces. So this is obviously like an Amazon example. But the attributes that you have on your website might not look the exact same right? Uh, when they get to Amazon because of different channel requirements. Uh, and at the right hand side, we have our print touch points. And in print touch points, you can see we have a lot of different things actually, right? We have not only our annual catalog, but we have things like spec sheets, direct mail opportunities like Mike was talking about. We have shipping labels. There's a lot of places that content that actually is also shown on these other channels in some cases. And it might be something simple like a product name and a SKU <coughs> number. And that's it on a shipping label, let's say. Um, but the content is used everywhere. Right? Um, so there's a lot of places that people are interacting with our content. Here's one thing I like to like kind of show is, um, especially with, with uh, teams that don't touch all these touch points, like the differences. Right? So for example, uh, if we want to talk about, at the, on the left hand side, this is where you have, as a brand, a low degree of control. And on the right hand side, this is where you have kind of like the high degree of control. So for example, when you're sending product information to, let's say, Amazon or Home Depot, whatever, they are in charge of the actual attributes that you can even display on a product detail page. They might have specific requirements about what those attribute values are. For colors, for example, you might call it bubble gum. They might say it must be pink. right? So you, you have to adapt your content to their context. Uh, at the same time, on your own brand website and on print, obviously you have a lot more flexibility because you're in control of that. Um, if we want to look at digital assets, similar story, right? They're going to have specific sizes that they want you to resize your assets to. Um, there's one specific retailer in uh, the United States called Menards uh, that I'm aware of that has very annoying uh, color space requirements for digital assets. And Menards is a retailer, so they get information from a lot of different brands. It's a huge pain in the butt for anyone who wants to put stuff on that particular channel to change all their assets only to match that marketplace, right? So low degree of control again. Um, at the same time, in print, you can have really anything you want. You can have lifestyle images. You can have really big, beautiful uh, images and stuff like that. And maybe you have a slightly less degree of control uh, with your digital channels because people are accessing on a device that you don't know what kind of device it will be. So you might want to change the images in a certain way that you know might work best um, that might not be the most beautiful way that your designers would prefer. Product relationships, again, so this is with them in a PIM context. You know, this product is related to this. This product is replaced by this, that kind of thing. Again, on your marketplace, you might have less control over what the actual marketplace allows you to show. Can you add an extended warranty, for example, on Best Buy? You know, you might not be able to. Whereas in your own channels, you know, you, especially in the print context, you can have a very loose, uh, experience for the designer where they can pick elements that they want to add very flexibly, right, and give a, a specific view uh, of related products and things like that to a higher degree than you can in digital because it's a lot harder to, to establish in like a SQL database or a PIM like the exact relationships you want and then make those be <coughs> visual. Um, similar with product merchandising, so this is, you can think of your enhanced content on Amazon, but when you scroll down, they call it below the fold, right, so when you get past 
the image and the buy box on Amazon, all that like images or lifestyle shots or videos or whatever. Um, again, you're a bit of a slave to that channel in terms of what content you can prepare. Whereas on your website or on in print, you have a lot more control. And similar for the formatting even, right? Um, uh, a famous example of this is uh, on Best Buy, or excuse me, Home Depot in the United States, they require that you have five bullet points for every product. If you don't have five bullet points, they'll reject your products, right? Um, so not only can you not choose what content you want to send there, but you might have something that's like a, a certification or something that you format as a bullet point just to meet that silly requirement of five bullet points, right? So you're sacrificing in some cases, you know, you have obviously better access to, there's more people going to Amazon.com than your brand site, very likely, but there is a cost to that in terms of control. So just wanted to have a visual example real quickly. So this is like three. I know the top right is not the exact same product. I couldn't find it in the specific print catalog. Um, but hopefully this makes sense. So if we only get like color options for this helmet, right? Um, on our website, you can see they've just taken the individual SKU uh, color uh, images and put them down there underneath. And you could probably click on any one of these and go to a new PDP, for example. Um, in the print, we just have little swatches, right? So very easy to see in a small space all of the available options. In the marketplace, however, it's a dropdown, and the dropdown doesn't have any swatch or anything, right? So personally, it's, it's less evident to me what are my <coughs> options when I'm looking at this particular product on this website, right? Uh, similarly, with approvals and standards, uh, and this is probably a little bit hard to see, but in the case of our website on over here, uh, we have basically they're all listed out, one, two, three, four. In the case of the print, we have little icons and stuff, which are personally I find visually easier to see, and especially if I'm familiar with this type of content, it's, oh, okay, it meets the, st the standard I need. Uh, it's very easy to understand. If we go over to the Granger example, however, what they've made them do is actually concatenate like four fields together. <laughs> so ba 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 ba. Here, here's the standards, right? This to me is obviously a less uh, visually compelling. Uh, way to arrange that information. And of course, you have to adapt your content, transform it to meet that standard. So you, know, you do lose a little bit of control uh, when, again, you're in a marketplace. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, what we wanted to talk about, so when we get into especially what Mike was talking about with personalization, is this is just a representative. Obviously, not everyone's going to look like this. Um, but on the left-hand side, in many cases, like you have what we would call core business data, right? So data will be flowing from your ERP, where, where SKUs are maybe born, or a PLM if you have one of those, right? So before you even maybe even green light a, project, a product, it might be in the PLM first, right? Um, eventually, that core business data will be fed into something like a PIM, so that you guys can start having the marketing team enrich stuff. Uh, you might also have that PIM then ping the dam system, or maybe the, uh, there's a separate workflow, for example, with Fusion, like Mike had mentioned earlier, uh, to take a request from ERP and tell PIM and dam, hey, we have a new product to, to enrich content for. Uh, in any event, there's centralized content systems that are going to be putting all that content together that you need for the three, in this case, uh, places that we're sending it. And then in the presentation layers we talked about, we have our CMS, right, our websites, uh, we have marketplaces we might be sending content to, and then we have the print touch points. The interesting thing to kind of call out here from the personalization uh, point of view, obviously on, uh, on Amazon or something like this, we're not in control of that channel. We don't have first party data, right? So we can't say, hey, David, here's the product you ordered uh, as the brand. Amazon can do that, but you can't, right? So if we want to personalize content, our options are really our own brand site, our own channels, and then print touch points, right? And the print touch point is something that I don't think a lot of people think about when they think about personalization, right? So we're, next thing I want to go through is just kind of like some sample workflows, right? So where does print fit into the <coughs> overall workflow, right? Um, so this is the annual catalog workflow. Um, I've drawn this out. Uh, basically to kind of like show what a lot of companies we work with or that I've worked with in the past would have as a workflow, right? So we have new products that are created. Uh, there's some sort of uh, mechanism within the PIM that says, hey, marketing guys, we need descriptions. Uh, hey, uh, uh, creative team, right? We need assets, right? So there's different things that are happening. Uh, eventually, we'll get to a point where product uh, information has been enriched to whatever uh, levels we desire as mandatory, probably uh, in one language. We might additionally have a need for translation services after that first language content is finalized. We'll have some sort of approval workflow, and then that is actually the trigger at that point in time. 
So before that, like print work can't really even start, right? Because the content's not there. We need to have a certain level of content before we start putting the stuff on the page, because otherwise things will move too much. It doesn't make sense to start working, right? And then, of course, anyone who has worked in print, you've probably seen this is just a very simplified version of it, but you know, the, the designer themselves probably are doing product selection, right? We don't have uh, non-designers in InDesign, for example. Um, the, the, the designers themselves are paginating or placing product records onto the page. Uh, then we have a proofreading process where maybe someone generates a PDF. Uh, maybe someone actually prints it out and starts handwriting comments. Hey, this is last year's picture. Um, so there's a whole process that goes on, which might require changes in InDesign, which might require content fixes in the PIM system, and then trigger a, basically an update workflow, right? Um, eventually we'll be in the OK stage, and finally we have a PDF generated. So a lot of, I think when people think of print, this is the kind of thing that they're often thinking about. Everyone knows that this is a super time consuming process, and that's where we can kind of help with automation uh, with, with obviously the, the software we have. Um, but this is what I think what a lot of people think about when they think about print. And a lot of people are thinking, maybe we don't want to do this anymore. Like, right, right, what's the point of making a 400 page or 4,000 page, depending on your company, catalog every single year. By the time it's done, it's out of date. You know, we can't even include pricing in there um, because it's already out of date by the time someone has it or purchases when they look at that catalog. What's the point, right? Um, so in many cases, a lot of customers do still have a need for the annual catalog, particularly B2B or regulated industries, right, where they have to have a, a print version for various reasons or because customers prefer them. <laughs> but this is a channel we definitely know is, is probably shrinking uh, in importance for a lot of companies. This is where um, we're starting to see the interesting use cases. This is what Mike had talked about a second ago. But in this case, we can see that uh, in the, in, you know, it's not going to work for every type of output. Some output will require manual touch-up or, or corrections. So you can't always fully automate certain things. But in the case of the data sheet service we have at the Kineo, it is actually possible for the trigger to, instead of being products are already, um, please contact print team for this type of output to be completely automated, right? So the signal is sent to our system. We will then generate the PDF kind of in the background unseen, uh, and then it goes linked back to the correct record in SKU, uh, excuse me, in PIM, and we're done, right? So this is one example of where uh, the content, the, the output that we need can be delivered uh, without a huge manual intervention. So this is one thing if you're looking for like, where does print fit in? Where is a value that we can get from print? This could be a highly manual task, and, my, and Matt talked in good detail about this yesterday, uh, for a lot of companies. So if you could erase, you know, instead of, I think the example was two hours to manually do this first 30 seconds or something uh, with our solution, right? That's a huge time savings, right? So this is one of the areas you can go to to get immediate value for outputs that you might actually need, right? Another example we have, so this is a very interesting one. This is the Wago uh, example that we had before. If you guys have seen uh, the demo, uh, great. If you haven't, you can go to like Wago's website and check this out. But in this case, essentially what you have is a customer themselves. So you, you could do this right now on your phone if you wanted to. Um, you could also wait till after I'm done talking if you're polite. Um, but you can actually choose products that you want, or you can choose search facets, right? You can even say after you've done that, like these are the attributes or types of product relationships that I'm interested in, and click a button and generate your own content. And the cool thing about this is that, you know, if you really wanted to, you could put other data sources in there. Hey, David, here's the, the PDF you just asked for, right? You could have the company logo on there. You know, you could have it in a, in a, a format that I could send to my purchasing team, for example. Uh, so you could be really creative with what you want here. But at the end of the day, you have a customized PDF generated. Um, and this is where I think one of the really interesting use cases is, is that, um, for example, in the United States, Granger is a very big distributor of uh, basically tools and, and hardware and stuff that's used for like building, construction. They used to make a, a, a gigantic catalog. It was like 4,000 pages. I worked at their lowly competitor. <laughs> we tried to make an annual catalog every year. And I was working there last in 2017. And our most recent catalog was a 2013. <laughs> and the reason for that is because it took years to put that thing together. Um, I mean, that we only had X number of copies even in the office. And whoever had a copy of that, it was like prison cigarettes. You know, you could, like, if you had that, you could get whatever you want in the office. Like, you want the catalog? But yeah. um, you could get your way. Um, and a lot of people have pretty much gotten rid of the, the big Bible uh, catalog for that very reason. Right? It's just too much time. Uh, it's, it's, it's not really 
uh, feasible to do that or cost effective to do that every single year anymore. Um, but if you have this sort of workflow in place, you know, especially in a B2B context where you know, maybe for example, a, a customer makes, yeah, they have a, a line of credit with you that's $50,000, let's say, and they only purchase from two or three product categories. Why are we sending them a 4,000 page catalog, right? Um, why don't we just send them catalog from the, the two or three categories of products that they are going to actually buy, right? Or why don't we only send them a catalog with uh, products that have been superseded or replaced by newer versions, for example. Maybe they're gonna upgrade uh, their, their plant or their factory or their office in some way. Um, so that's a way that we could pull in that personal data we have about them, somehow leverage their, their actual purchasing patterns or interests, likes, etc., to give them a custom output PDF without really having manual intervention in the middle. Um, so these are there's some, again, is intended to be food for thought uh, to, to help you guys when you're thinking about where to position print or what are the opportunities uh, in the print space. Um, but really, in terms of what I was hoping to show today, this is kind of uh, everything. So I guess we are happy now to take any questions, comments uh, that you might have about where we fit into the whole content strategy or architecture uh, for your customers or for yourselves. Yeah, and I think uh, our marketing department is always interested in hearing your use case in these areas. Uh, we need to continue to promote. You know, again, it's not just about us and Print Suite. Uh, it's about your marketing colleagues better understanding <coughs> the impact of print and how this can be integrated it's just another channel, and it's a channel that has its own power and value. So I encourage you to, if you haven't done so already, share your stories with us. Uh, maybe you even do a case study, or just simply tell us what you're doing. It's, it's fascinating uh, to hear. There was talking to someone last night who was telling me an, a use case about um, travel. Uh, I can't remember if it was a cruise ship or what, but. Um, they send every individual who uh, has booked a cruise their own personalized itinerary. And uh, you ask yourself, well, why not just email it to them? Well, what happens is they have it on their table at home and their friends come by and they say, tell me about your cruise. And you pull this nice, I guess it was printed on high quality paper. Yeah, I see the louder guys there. I heard it from your uh, colleague or ex-colleague of yours, right? Yeah, 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 Christoph, yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's really cool, because, you know, you want to, uh, you want to share your, your, your story. Who doesn't want to talk about their vacation? I don't know if we all want to listen, but uh, we like to talk and show these things. And so anyway, uh, please continue to share your stories about how you're using print in kind of an integrated, omni-channel way. Thank you very much. We'll be around for a few minutes, although I'm going to go upstairs and uh, kick off uh, my old friend from Adobe, Ingo Eichel. He's speaking in 10 minutes about the creative side of Adobe. So thank you.